floor plans get a lot of attention. People are most familiar with that in, in the set of architectural drawings, but the lighting plan and the lighting design, that really determines how we feel in a place. And for me, designing the lighting uh, is not about evenly lighting spaces. It's it's developing contrast. So, you know, that difference between light and dark, that's the thing that makes you feel something in a space. So we're gonna be designing the lighting plan today. I'll show you my process for doing that, how we go about choosing fixtures, where we space them, and everything that goes into it. And at the end, you'll see how it all comes together in the finished drawing. Okay, so we have the floor plans printed out. I'm generally starting every lighting design by sketching a couple of different fixture layouts. And when I say fixture, I mean, is it a pendant? Is it a recessed light? Is it a wall sconce? We're gonna determine what fixture types we're gonna use where first, and then we'll take this into the computer and we'll do the circuiting and switching diagrams in the computer. In general, with our lighting plan, you can see here that the floor plan is kind of grayed out. The walls are grayed out. The most important information in a lighting plan are the fixtures and the switching. So those things will be more prominent on the page and I usually do them in red. So on the floor plan, it's important to understand where your ceiling planes are, where your flat ceiling planes are, where your pitched ceiling planes are, and also the furniture layout. So you wanna know where the dining table is, where your reading, your sitting groups are going to be. All these things inform the pattern of use and that's a great way to begin thinking about the lighting plan. In general, as we're beginning our design, we have three types of light that we consider when we're designing a lighting plan. We have ambient light and that sets the general level of illumination in a space. We have task lighting, which helps us to accomplish certain tasks, whether that's bathing or reading or cooking. And then we have accent lighting and accent lighting is used to highlight features in the architecture that we want to call attention to a fireplace, artwork, some other feature that we deem important. So my general first pass here is going to be to lay out some recessed lighting and recessed lighting is nice for creating ambient lighting. It's neutral, it's unobtrusive, and they actually fit with lots of different styles. But what I don't want to do is create a even grid of fixtures across the whole ceiling. You know, the thing that makes the forest beautiful is the contrast between lights and darks. And in fact, if you look at some of our reference images, you'll notice that all of these images have some degree of contrast in them. So light areas and dark areas. And we want to begin building contrast in our lighting plan in the same way. Now, a good rule of thumb as we're thinking about spacing of these fixtures, take the ceiling height and divide it by two. And doing that sets this sort of horizontal space. And the reason this works is if we just look at a section through the space, and let's say we have a recessed light here, and we have a recessed light here, and that casts a cone of light like this. We're looking to evenly light this surface here. As the ceiling height gets taller, let's say we kept that same spacing. If we kept the same spacing, we're effectively over lighting the floor space here because this beam of light overlaps this beam of light. So we can actually increase the spacing for taller ceilings. Of course, that's gonna be informed by the actual light fixture that you choose. Here, I've chosen a gimbal light fixture. So this recessed is able to be sort of twisted and turned, has a full degree of rotation. So we can actually take this light and aim it over here, or we can aim it here. Now equally for uh, something like a dressing area, we could point one here, we could point one here. So I like this level of adjustability that these gimbal fixtures offer. And start to use it to really create these kind of luminous planes in these spaces. So I can really start to shape the light in a way. Code requires us to have a light at every exterior door. So we'll have one here. Let's also add one here and we can use that to sort of wash this wall if we choose. I'll probably also add a step light at this door and this lights the steps here. It's kind of a safety issue. And then probably we'll want to do some feet, some path lighting that sort of heads out in this direction. As I know, this is the approach and in the evening, as someone's returning home, we probably want to light this path or if they have guests arriving, we want to light that path. Um, let's move into the bathroom here. We can continue this sort of recessed light layout and we'll probably do a couple of different layouts. So this will be one option. I'll show you what maybe another option will be with the other bathroom. Again, we'll create this kind of luminous 
uh, wall surface here. And then in the bathtub area, I'll, I'll probably use one of these gimbal fixtures, but I'll aim it in this direction. I think you want to res resist this tendency to really light and center on every object. You know, think about being in the tub. You don't actually want to be on stage necessarily. So I think lighting the spaces surrounding it is kind of nice. And we could do some accent lighting in here if we chose uh, some sort of up light element. As you get to a uh, feature like the vanity, if we have a mirror here, the ideal uh, situation for lighting a vanity as you're standing here and using it is to have an even light that is lighting your face. So one option here could be a couple of sort of glass tube pendants that hang down and really cast a, a pleasing light on the face. You're evenly lighting the face. Uh, if, if you were to set a recessed light here and aim it this direction, you'd be casting all kinds of shadows. That's a really harsh light. Another option would be to have a couple of recessed pointed this way so that you're really using the mirror as this reflected surface. As we come to the vaulted space here, let's look at the section of that. So here is the section through that main living space. And we want to begin thinking about how the lighting plan is going to complement the architecture in this space. And we have some nice daylight that is lighting either side here. So we have a window bank here and a window bank here. Now, just because this space has a lot of daylight in it doesn't mean that we don't provide, you know, our supplemental light in our lighting plan. Okay, so we have the human figure in here just for some scale reference. I'm going to begin thinking about how we can create some contrast in this space. So, you know, if we were to just evenly place a grid of lights, it, it doesn't seem very pleasing to me. One of the things I was thinking about was how do we fill the volume of this space and maybe treat the ceiling similarly to how we're treating these wall surfaces and that we could have this ceiling act as a sort of luminous plane. So what if we had some adjustable monopoints that are really starting to wash this ceiling with light. And that really creates then a nice surface. And if this is a wood ceiling, this creates a nice ambient light surface uh, to light up the room. Um, and of course, in a living room, we have a number of different tasks. So we're going to have a dining table in here, right? So that'll sit in this kind of zone. And so we have people seated at the table here. So we'll want some kind of fixture that really keys into that table. It's probably a pendant. You know, it could also be a couple of pin spots. It could be, you know, candlelight. And then on this side, let's consider this to be maybe a spot, a series of spots that are lighting, creating these sort of pools of light on this side. So now we have this contrast between these sort of different types of light. And then of course we have in our sort of reading zone over here, probably, you know, a floor lamp. Maybe there's a floor lamp here. So we want to provide some outlets in the floor. So let's start doing the layout here. As we do this layout, let's think about how it keys into the architecture. Okay, so we talked about maybe doing some recessed and then let's just center it on these windows. So we wanted to have it, you know, it should make sense. These I'm not showing an arrow because we're going to keep the gimbal fixtures pointed straight down. And then here are our wall sconce slash mono points. And again, we'll center those over each one of these windows like this. So that bank can then light and create this luminous plane here. And then over the dining table, we'll probably do a pendant fixture. So that creates task lighting there. And then let's say at each end of the couch, we have an in-floor outlet so that we can use some task lighting here for reading. And of course, when we do the receptacle layout, we'll handle that here as well. Now, this is a prime reason why we're doing the lighting plan now, because if we were to do this after the fact, after we've already designed our structural plan, you can imagine we have framing members in the roof here, right? So if we want to be locating recessed lights in this roof plane, or we want a junction box for power to supply our pendant fixtures, or we have a header over this, you know, bank of windows, we need to plan for all these things 
before we finalize the structural design. This, no. I've had this happen many times before where you know, we didn't overlay the lighting plan on the structural plan and you want this you know, bank of lights centered, say in this hallway, but there's a framing member right there. So what a disaster it would be to have these lights sort of you know, six inches off center in this hallway. Um, it just forces you to make decisions you might not otherwise make. So let's talk about uh, this deck lighting situation. So in this space here at night, each one of these windows is gonna be a black plane if we don't do something on the outside face. So what I'm gonna propose is that we do some sort of in-deck light fixtures. And these are just recessed in the deck. They have a little port to one side and they create these kind of little pools of light and this is stargazing territory, so you know we're not looking to provide a high level of illumination out here, but what this does is it increases the dimension of this interior space, so we have some perception of this outdoor space on the deck. And then over here, I would probably do, you know, I'd probably do one here, here, and here. Similar kind of gesture, so a little pool of light we're not evenly lighting this thing, but then you can see it kind of reinforces the architecture, how this is kind of stepping down the hillside. So we'll have to figure out where these are switched from at, at some point. Um, we'll do that when we get into the computer. Also at this exterior door, I'll probably do a step light here. So that's unobtrusive, low profile. And then I'm gonna propose we do one here and here as well. Uh, we may decide to eliminate these if the owner says this isn't important to me. So. We'll just have that discussion um, next. Now, I, the only thing we haven't addressed in this space is as this vaulted space comes up, it actually comes up all the way to this wall face. So this acts as this kind of reading loft above here. So what I'm gonna propose up here is that we just do kind of a, a plug-in fixture that sits above here and it's switched down here so we can switch the light on. And that's a little sort of accent light. We could also do a couple of pin spots maybe, maybe two pin spots that really kind of highlight this shelf up there or any objects that they have up there. So that handles, I think, the range and layers of lighting in this main space. As we come to this bathroom space, what I'm gonna propose is an alternative lighting plan here is maybe we create this sort of recessed trough. And if we cut the section through this space, what if there's a recessed trough up here that then washes this whole face with light? So this becomes the luminous plane here and we have our fixture up, up high. And then, you know, maybe we just do a couple of wall sconces, very simple wall sconces here. And as you're standing at the lav, this is just washing your face with a nice even light. Our guest bedroom, we have a Murphy bed here. So this bed folds in and out of this wall. And it'd be nice to have some small fixtures sort of embedded inside of this. And I saw in the lighting catalog here, this kind of a fixture could be nice. So it kind of flips up and down. Um, so we could sort of nestle that in there equally that that might be able to work. Okay, so we have all the fixtures sketched out, a couple of options. We're gonna get that into the digital environment and then we'll start working on the switching. So here we are in CAD. I've completed the fixture layout based on the sketches that we've come up with. So I have a couple of different options here. And you'll notice each one of these fixture types has a letter designation. They also have a symbol and each one of these symbols are called out in our electrical plan legend here. Now you'll see certain light fixtures have different designations. So for a recessed light, the recessed light also has a housing and I put this housing on a layer that doesn't actually print, but I need to know where the housing is and the orientation of it because it's gonna interface with my you know, ceiling framing in here. So I'll want to know if there are hidden components to these different fixtures, I'll wanna indicate those on the plan just so that I know that they're gonna be able to align with my framing layout or different structural elements that are in the plan. The other thing that's not represented here that we wanna add is say for this wall sconce, we know that that's gonna to have to be located at a certain height. So we're just gonna call that seven foot six above the finished floor. And we can give that a typical note so that 
every one of these wall sconces, the electrician will know at what height we want it mounted. Same thing, we'd want to indicate, you know, the bottom of where we want this pendant mounted, or maybe we're just going to say we want to verify it in field so we can actually bring the table in that they're using and sit down at it and make sure that the pendant is not obstructing their view. The other thing that I'll start doing here is I'll start calling out certain centerings. So if I want this light to be centered on this window, I'm just going to indicate that here. And in the pre-construction meeting with the electrician, we're going to have this conversation anyway. But if I want people to pay attention to certain certain centerings, I'm just going to make sure it's explicit on the drawings. So I've called that out here, and I'd probably do a similar thing here. You know, I want it. I want these to be centered on the distance between, say, the table or say the island and this wall face. So I'll just you know, I would call that out. And if there are dimensional requirements, you know, I would call that out in this in this way too. So for example, these two lights, I wanna make sure that they're two feet apart. So I would call that out here, or I wanna make sure this is centered in that hallway. I'd probably show that here. This is a definite centering must. So let's show this one too. So once I've done that, I will probably go through and label this up, you know, much more explicitly. But once I've completed that, I'll start working on my circuiting and the circuiting is just defining which lights are switched on together so here you'll see is my block indication for a dimmer switch and I don't call out three-way or four-way switches uh, it leads to confusion if you decide to change the number of switches that you're adding to a circuit and you forget to change the designation from a three-way to a four-way that can be an opening for a change order and so I just leave it up to the electrician to determine whether or not a switch is actually a three-way or a four-way or it's just a single switch um, so let's add a couple of switches at this front entry door and one of the ways I begin laying out these switches is to think about use patterns so we're coming into the house we want to switch these lights on together so I'll start laying out this circuit you can think of this almost as if it were the wiring that's connecting these fixtures. So I want these two lights sitting in this porch roof to come on at the same time. So I'm gonna connect them here. And then I also want this little step light to come on at the same time. Now I usually have the exterior lights closest to the front door, and then we have to start making some decisions about what, what the next switch bank is. We have some path lighting there, so we're gonna have to make a determination about you know where that one goes. So that seems to make sense there. And then I think the next bank of, of lights that we want to switch together are the kitchen bank. So these are the kitchen recessed. And it's up to you how you draw these lines. I prefer to have them sort of arcing like this. And I'm going to put all the kitchen lights on together. Uh, it's possible we may want to switch the island separately if there's a different lighting level required here, say they want to use this for serving, and this is really used for food prep and we want separate control, but that is probably a discussion we'll have with the owner. Obviously, the more uh, switches and circuits you have, the more you're adding to your lighting budget. So we'll think about use patterns and, and how these lights are connected together. So like this front bank of lights, these all want to be on one circuit, I think. And then, you know, as we think about how these actually get used, we probably want to have some control on this end. You can see we have a door that's leading to the master suite and it's a pocket door. So we're probably not going to have a lot of room in here put, to put a switch here. So I'm going to locate the switches on this wall and then I'm going to have two of them. So I'm going to have a way to control this circuit. So we can turn this circuit off as they're heading to bed. And then we want a way to control this circuit so they can navigate to the bedroom. Now you'll notice every one of these switch banks is on a dimming circuit. The ability to alter the level of illumination in a home and change the scenes in a room just gives you that extra level of granular control. And our lighting needs change, you know, especially in a space like a living room, this is used for entertaining. It's maybe this table is used for remote working or homework, uh, the dining table. And, you know, maybe as you're reading, you don't want a lot of light over here, but you want to just be able to switch on a floor lamp. So, you know, 
having dimmers allows you to change the scenes and the lighting levels in it just gives you more control over that. So let's look at this location and how we might switch these exterior lights. The most obvious place to put our switch is probably going to be at this location right here. As we're headed out the door, we click on these exterior lights, right? But what we know is this bank of windows is going to have a large header over the top of it, and then it's going to be supported at a post at either end. Now the post is probably going to be here. Uh, it could also be located here, but either way, we're going to have some framing members in the wall here. And if we were to locate a switch and try and get our wiring to and from this, it's overly complicated. So I would probably locate this switch here and I'd probably locate. So we probably want to control this bank of lighting at this face, these lights here in the same location. So we can group these two lights together. And uh, I'd work this circuit like this and continue on. And then I'd work on the exterior circuit right here as well. Whoops. So the exterior circuit would just work like this. And then we have to decide, you know, are we going to light this whole group together? And I would say probably yes. So like to move these objects out of the way if there's any kind of conflict. So if we have circuits that are kind of crossing over each other, we know this switch is on this side and this wants to be over here. And I'm not suggesting that it does, uh, but if we do, and oftentimes we will, the convention is just to indicate that this circuit kind of hops over that one. So I just use this little sort of circle. Next step is to come and place some outlets. So we have floor outlets in here. We know we want a floor outlet, you know, by the edge of this couch, because we're gonna probably have some task lighting in so here. We'll probably have one at this end of the couch as well. And I'd still like to line things up where possible. So if this furniture were to move in the future, that it wouldn't look completely out of place. We have wall receptacles here, and the wall receptacles, just like the lighting, I like to align it with architectural elements. The code is going to dictate where we place our receptacles. So we have to be within six feet of a receptacle. So, you know, we have a 12 foot center to center spacing on these. And you can see if I did 12 feet from the center line of this window, it doesn't really align with anything. So we can either choose to put it here, or we can space it to the center line of this end window and we can use this outlet to gain our you know we'll still be within six feet of that if as long as this outlet is within 18 inches of the wall it still counts as part of a wall outlet okay so that that'll satisfy that requirement we'll do the same on the other side as we come to space like the kitchen for example kitchen has different space requirements here we have to be within two feet of an outlet this is all specified in the code that we are using for this project, which is the 2015 IRC. So I'm just going to space these two out two feet between them because, you know, it's, I don't, um, if I were to space it out any further, we'd land at the edge of the sink. And, uh, this seems like enough outlets to use for this space. So we do that. And then the other thing we need to start indicating just like we did over here with the height of this fixture, if we have a non-standard height for an outlet, we want to just be calling it out. So I'm going to call this out 39 inches. So our counter height is 36 inches. This will be three inches above it. And then this is the kind of thing that we can call out as a typical note on our legend. So you'll see, unless noted otherwise, that's what the UNO stands for. All receptacles are to be installed at six inches above the finished floor horizontally. And then if we note it otherwise here, the counter outlets we're calling at 39 inches and we're saying we're going to enter we're going to locate our switches here and our keypads here and so we go through the the entire plan and, and just try and specify these non-standard things so as an electrician is looking at this plan they really start to understand oh okay this this fixture's up really high so this is a, a longer run of wiring for me so we're going to go through the entire plan and with every electrical device we're going to be providing power to it we're going to indicate where it's located on the plan we'll add life safety features like smoke detectors carbon monoxide detectors any special equipment 
ceiling fans. The final thing we'll do is we'll come in and layer on any sort of annotations that describe things that we don't describe with symbols on the plan. So you can see there's just a ton of decisions to be made here about fixtures and switching and receptacle locations. And it may seem like a lot. I mean, you can build a house from a set of five drawings. You can build a house from a set of 50 drawings or 100 drawings. Um, and the difference between those is just the amount of control that you have over the process. And you know, I think architects by nature are control freaks. I'm certainly a control freak. And so I'd prefer to make these decisions now while I have time to think about it and also time to change things if they're in the way structure, mechanical systems, plumbing systems, the things that are sort of invisible infrastructure is malleable and able to be changed now. When we get out into the field, those decisions essentially are made for us already. And so we're reacting to these things. So if we can put it on a drawing and codify those decisions beforehand, that's my preference. So up next, I'm gonna start building this. It's about time, right? <laughs> Stay tuned.